Hey guys, so my baby is six months old today and I'm finally, finally getting around to filming this labor and birth story video. Um, it's been a hell of a ride and uh, postpartum was extremely, extremely hard for me. I didn't have any time to ever sit down and really get to filming this, so today I'm going to finally do it. I go back to work tomorrow, so I've been on maternity leave for almost seven months because I had three weeks off before I gave birth. So it's going to be about seven months, and he's exactly six months old today. So yeah, I'm in his nursery right now, and I'm going to just go ahead and film this video. It is extremely, extremely long. Um, and to be honest with you, it has been six months. I've forgotten a lot of details, but I'm going to try and do my very best. Um, before I get started though, I just kind of want to give some background information on my pregnancy if you're not familiar with all the things that I went through. Um, I tested positive for GBS. I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes as well. Um, I was able to control it with my diet, so I've never actually needed insulin shots or anything like that. He had some abnormal findings on his uh, anatomy scan and his arms and legs, the long bones in his arms and legs all measured extremely short compared to the rest of his body. He was um, measuring under the 1 percentile, whereas the rest of his body was in the 30th and 50th percentile. His arm and legs, just the long bones, were measuring at below 1%. So we had uh, extra genetic testing done, we had a um, fetal heart echo done, and we just had a bunch of other tests done. Everything came back normal, but he just was measuring abnormally on the smaller end. Um, he was lagging about two weeks behind and then right about, I think when I went to get my 34, 36 week scan, um, I was getting ultrasounds very regularly because of his bones. They kept wanting to make sure that they were measuring it and see if it would catch up. Um, it never did actually and at, like I said, my 36 week ultrasound, um, they compared it to my like 32 week ultrasound and in the four weeks he barely grew at all and they were like, you need to get induced. Um, your baby's not growing at the rate that he's supposed to be growing and we think that it's better if we get him out. Plus I have gestational diabetes, so with that being said, they normally like to have you deliver about 39 weeks anyway. So I went ahead and scheduled my um, induction date I never actually made it <laughs> to my induction date just because he was measuring super small um, that they decided to push his due date uh, back a week. Sunday night, September 1st, and um, I woke up from a nap around 9 p.m. and I didn't eat, I wasn't feeling very good. The week before, I was in the triage because I had a huge, huge headache, funny feeling in my ear. My ear kept hurting. I kept thinking that I had an ear infection in my right ear. I got it checked out. The headache kind of like subsided and then they looked at my ear my ear was not infected in any way. So they went ahead and sent me home. My blood pressure was high when I got in there, but it measured fine later. So to be diagnosed with preeclampsia, your blood pressure needs to be high, I think two times within like a three or four hour range. So you have to measure high twice and I didn't measure high twice. Um, I measured high once and then when they monitored me for about four hours or so, my blood pressure went back to normal. So they sent me home. Well, Sunday night, um, I woke up, my face felt really funny, my eye wasn't blinking, and it just felt like my eye was like constrained. It was pulling, it was very tight, I couldn't close my eyes, I couldn't blink, it just felt weird. Um, my dad has had Bell's palsy before, so I knew what Bell's palsy looked like, and I knew that it was Bell's palsy. Um, I researched it a little bit, and I was pretty sure that that's what I had. Well, it was Sunday night, it wasn't an emergency, and it was very, very, very minimal, so I decided not to go to the doctors. Plus, it would be the ER, and this wasn't an emergency, so I could, it could wait till tomorrow morning. So I went to sleep. I was so afraid because I knew that my face was going to be paralyzed, even though at that moment it was only my eyelid. Um, I just knew. I was like, my face is going to be paralyzed. It's just going to be crushing. So uh, Monday morning comes. It's Labor Day. It's still a holiday, but the clinic uh, is open. So the acute care clinic is open. It's where you go, where it's not an emergency, but you go there to get seen on um, holidays and, and anytime you don't have a regular doctor's appointment. So I went in, they opened at 8, I went in at 8, me and Simon went, and they got me checked in, and as soon as she looked at my face, 
uh, she kind of assessed what was going on. It did get a little bit worse, so I still had that headache. My ears still felt funny. It was on the same side that that Bell's palsy was happening, which means that the Bell's palsy was coming um, a week ago already, but it just actually hasn't gotten to any face droopiness. So what had happened was it's now spread to my forehead and a couple other parts of my cheek. Uh, when I raised my eyebrow, this one wouldn't go up anymore, and you couldn't see like the eyebrow, like you know, wrinkles on your forehead anymore. Uh, so the doctor there said that she thinks it's Bell's palsy, but then of course they have to rule out the possibility of a stroke, just because paralysis, um, you know, could be caused by a stroke. So she was like, you need to go to the ER across the street. We don't have the equipment here. Like, you need to go. I have let them know that you're there, you're coming. And I was like, is it okay if I, like, just eat first? So Simon and I actually went to a local subway that was in the hospital area. We ate first, and then I calmly walked across the street to the ER, and they were expecting me. And they took me to the back, like, right away, and then they had me sit in the... The ER is kind of packed, so they had me sit in the hallway of the ER. I didn't actually get like a room. Uh, so I sat in the hallway and then I got my blood drawn in the hallway and everything and like just a swarm of doctors came because I was at that time technically 39 and a half weeks pregnant, but based on the pushed further back due date, I was, I was 38 and a half weeks pregnant and at that point location so I go to UCSF and this is um, Parnassus that we're talking about so I was at UCSF Parnassus because that's where the emergency room is they don't deliver babies there they deliver babies at the new UCSF campus which is in Mission Bay so they don't deliver babies there they like don't, didn't even have an ultrasound there they didn't even have a heart, fetal heart doppler there so they couldn't like they couldn't look at the baby really, they couldn't hear the heartbeat, they couldn't anything. They were freaking out that I was there pregnant as hell, like with the possibility of a stroke was how they were treating me. So a bunch of neurologists rushed over to me, I had my blood drawn like right there, sitting there, and they were like, we're going to start you on the IV line right now, um, just in case. So I had an IV line put in on my right arm, and a bunch of neurologists came to see me, they did a bunch of neural tests on me, follow the finger, you know, touch my finger, touch your nose, look at the light, could you walk around, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I got that done and then um, they took my blood pressure. It was extremely high. I was um, at around 150 something over 95, kind of something like that. So it's not, I mean, it's not terribly high. They ran my labs and with preeclampsia, you, it affects your liver. So my ALT numbers were really, really high. It was, when I went in, it was 220. And so that was considered really, really, really high. Because I think regularly, pre-pregnancy, my liver numbers were like 21. So it was like 100 times the normal amount. So it was super high. They were freaking out because I had full-blown preeclampsia with severe features. Severe features is when it starts affecting your organs and my liver was like really affected by it. Um, but then they wanted to run an MRI because, you know, I could also be having a stroke at the same time. So they were just really, really worried about me, especially like I said, they didn't handle labor and delivery there and I was super pregnant. They were calling back and forth. They were calling Mission Bay and they were like, hey, what do we do with her? And the Mission Bay was like, send her over here. And then Parnassus was like, well, we don't want to send her over yet. Like she might be having a stroke. We need to do an MRI before we send her over there. And then Mission Bay was like, okay, you guys do the MRI there and then send her over here. Um, it, it got serious. Like I knew it was serious when there were like 10 different doctors standing in front of me around my bed at the same time. Simon was saying that he has never ever seen so many doctors swarm like anyone before and I knew that was serious. I was like, okay, this is not good if I have someone from every department here asking me questions. And they were, they were arguing because you know, there was an OB there. The OB wanted me to do this, but Neuro wanted me to do that. And then, like, the general ER physician that was there wanted me to do this. Like, there was just so many things that so many different people wanted me to do, and they couldn't really figure out what was more important, what they wanted me to do first, and how they should handle everything. So they kind of, like, hashed it out and had, like, a meeting, kind of, like, everyone with, like, really high tensions because they were arguing 
for themselves, you know? Um, they found this janky um, a Doppler thing. It was literally metal and like they could barely find a heartbeat, but they found the heartbeat. They're like, okay, baby's fine. Um, but because of my preeclampsia, OB needed me to start on a magnesium drip right away to prevent me from having a stroke. Because when your blood pressure is really high, you and your baby can have a stroke. So to counteract that, you need to be given a magnesium drip. So the magnesium drip was literally the most terrible thing in the world. It was so, so painful and so uncomfortable. So they're glad they started the IV line on this arm and they were like, we're going to start your magnesium drip. But for the first 20 minutes, it's got to be like a boost of it. So they got to give you a lot heavy dose at once. And then after 20 minutes, they do it for a lighter dose, I think for the next couple of hours or something like that. And I was like, okay. And she was like, you're going to feel super, super hot and you're going to feel like you're burning up and you might feel some nausea. As soon as that magnesium drip went in, I like wanted to die. Like this is the worst. Like I might even take labor pains over this magnesium drip. My whole body felt like it was on fire. My vein that it was going into was like burning and it was so painful that I was like holding this arm. I couldn't move. I was sweating. They gave me an ice pack to put on my neck and it didn't even feel cold at all. My mouth was so dry and I was in so much pain and discomfort that I pretty much zoned out. Like I couldn't talk anymore. It hurt so bad I cried. I did not even cry giving birth. I freaking cried on that magnesium drip. It was intense. So after that first 20 minutes, um, they lowered the dosage to the lighter dose. And then as soon as they lowered the dosage, like I felt instantly better. I didn't feel nauseous at all though, which is really, really good. They needed to get me in for an MRI and they needed to somehow do this while the magnesium drip is in my arm. So they had to change all the tubings and make the tubing super long because there's no metal that you know can go into the MRI machine. I couldn't get the contrast, the dye that they would normally inject in you because I was pregnant and it's not safe for when you're pregnant. An MRI is completely safe, but the contrast was not, so I didn't get that. So I went in, did my MRI while I was still getting my magnesium drip, did that, came back out, and um, they were like, okay, you need to go into an ambulance and we need to transfer you over to the labor and delivery campus, right? So I was like, do I have to go by ambulance? And they were like, yeah, you have to go by ambulance. One, we need to monitor your blood pressure, and two, like, you, you need this magnesium drip. But then it turns out, like for whatever reason, they couldn't take the drip in the vehicle with them. So they were like, all right, we're gonna have to pull it out of you, and then we're gonna give you two fat magnesium shots, one in each thigh, to get you there. And those shots were just as painful, if not more painful, than the goddamn magnesium drip itself. Instantly, when he, they, they did it two at the same time, and one into each thigh, instantly when it went in, the burning sensation was crazy, and my legs felt like they were 100 pounds each. I couldn't move. My pants were down to my ankles, and I was just laying there with my pants down to my ankles. I couldn't move my legs. They were burning. They were hurting. They gave me ice packs. They gave me heat packs to, to like, you know, help with the pain. Nothing worked. Paramedics took me into the ambulance and got me to the other campus. I was rolled in, checked in, everything was cool. Um, my pants were still down at my ankles, okay? Because <laughs> I couldn't move, I couldn't pull them up, like my legs were dead. Um, yeah, so then they got me checked in. And, um, oh yeah, by the way, before they transferred me at the other hospital, I was like, can I have some water? I'm really thirsty from the magnesium drip. They were like, no. And I was like, could I pee? And they were like, no. They were just so scared because I was so pregnant that they did not want me to move and they didn't want me to do anything just in case like I needed surgery or whatever. They just didn't want me to get up and do anything. Got to labor and delivery and labor and delivery was like, here's a big glass of water and you can go pee. Oh my god. It was like the best thing in the world because I went from like, you need to sit here, you can't move to like, oh, you're, you're fine. Like you can go ahead and pee and drink water or whatever. Got checked in, um, you know, they did an ultrasound, everything looked good, baby's head was down, and um, my mom came, Steph came, Simon came, they brought my hospital bag and everything like that, and I was like, all right, cool, so I'm just chilling here. Um, while I was waiting, the results for the MRI came back. They wanted, uh, neurology wanted to clear me before they induced me for labor, just in case there was something going on in my brain. 
uh, for the Bell's palsy. They diagnosed me with Bell's palsy, but however, on my scan, uh, they found an incidental finding, which is something they weren't looking for, but they just kind of came across. I actually have a cyst on my pituitary gland. It's called a pituitary adenoma, and it is about six millimeters in diameter. Um, it's not big, but it's not small either, and um, it was not there on a previous MRI. Because they found a pituitary adenoma, um, they wanted to do a repeat MRI with the focus on the pituitary gland before they induced me again. So I still had to wait. And by this time, it was probably, I think it was already like 8 p.m. at night. Um, so I've pretty much been there all day. It's been 12 hours already. So I got to the labor and birth um campus at around 3 p.m. and I was just kind of chilling doing nothing and then at around 8 p.m. they wanted me to redo it. So the numbers were getting even worse. It went from 220 to 256. Um, so they were like, okay, you know, we need to hurry up and induce you. Your preeclampsia is pretty bad and they're like, the best way is just to deliver it and we want to get this baby out ASAP. Went back for another MRI with the focus on the pituitary gland. At this point, I had two IVs in me. I had one on each, uh, like a port on each um, arm right here. And once again, we had to change into the super long tubing to go and get my MRI. Got another MRI done, and then neurology came back with the results, and they were like, yep, yeah, your pituitary anemoma is there. Like, your pituitary gland is swollen, but being pregnant also can cause swollen pituitary glands, so. They're like, we will just have to reassess you after you give birth. And they asked me if I've ever had any like weird hormonal unbalances that I've experienced throughout my life. And I really haven't. My period has been super, super on time. And I was able to get pregnant super easily. So I don't really see um, it really affecting my life that much. At least not that I know of just yet. Um, we will have to get reassessed. Or I will have to get reassessed. Um, when I finish breastfeeding, just because breastfeeding kind of throws off your regular levels of hormones um, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to have to get reassessed when time comes and that's something totally separate that I'm going to have to deal with later on. So it's now 10 p.m. Um, neurology was like, cool, you're good to go, go ahead, you know, so then labor and delivery wanted to go ahead and induce me. They gave me miso and miso is a pill that's supposed to soften and thin out your cervix. I had the oral one that you take. The pill was like super, super tiny. It wasn't even a pill. It was like a partial piece of a pill. Um, yeah, I felt like it was like a fourth of a pill or something. They gave me the lowest dose of miso. I took it and you're supposed to take it every two hours. And the, uh, the plan was to get six rounds of miso in. I didn't actually get six rounds of miso in because I didn't need six rounds of miso in. So at 10 p.m. they started miso. At 12.30 they checked me. I was already two centimeter dilated. When I went in, I was 0% dilated and I was 0% effaced, which means that my cervix was like thick and hard and not soft and that like baby was really far off. Like my body was not ready to give birth at all. Um, so at 12.30 at midnight, it was two centimeters, so like, okay, we're gonna go ahead and put in the balloon. Um, oh, I forgot to mention something. Before they redid the MRI when I got checked in at labor delivery, they did a membrane sweep, which means that the, um, the OB sticks the, her fingers up your vagina, up to your cervix, and then detaches, I think it detaches like um, the, the baby's sac from your uterus wall, caused a little bit of bleeding, that freaking hurt because I wasn't prepared for it. She didn't mention anything about sweeping my membrane. She was like, oh, let me just check you. And then she just went ahead and did it. I was like, yeah, I didn't even know what she was doing. She didn't say a thing. That really made me mad because I was like, you could have at least told me so I could have prepared myself. She didn't tell me. But anyways, yeah, back to the story. Anyways, so then now they put in the balloon. The balloon surprisingly did not hurt for me at all. They stick a balloon in, it's deflated, and then they fill it with water after it's in place. And then you have a tube that's tied to the inner side of your thigh so that there's a little bit of tension on it to kind of like pull it, you know? They fill it up and then once you hit four centimeters, it should fall out itself. So every two hours, I was still getting that miso pill to thin out my cervix. I tried to sleep and managed to sleep for about two hours from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., but that's all the sleep that I got. Um, I did have some contractions throughout the night, but they were really light. Um, yeah, they weren't that bad really at all. 
and um, in the beginning it kind of hurt but then as time went on it got lighter and lighter and lighter I'm not sure if it's something where my body just kind of got used to it or what but I was texting and just talking through it fine like it was not a big deal so now it's September 3rd and um, at 7 30 in the morning like I said I fell asleep right and when I woke up at 7 30 the nurse came in and checked me and she was like oh your balloon fell out and I was like oh cool I, I had no idea it fell asleep when I mean I fell out when I was sleeping so I don't know what that felt like or anything like that so she just pulled it out uh, which just felt like pulling out a tampon or something like that it's like wasn't very painful at all or not painful at, at all and then at that point when the balloon falls out you're forced on me to sign you like and they were like, okay, cool, no more miso for you. So I got five ounces of miso in. They're like, your cervix is thin enough, you're four centimeters dilated, you know, your GBS positive, like your preeclampsia is still really bad. They rewrapped my labs that morning and it came out to be 285, so it kept climbing. Even with the magnesium, my liver, it just, the numbers just kept climbing. So they were like, we want to get this out ASAP, like now, today, um, we are gonna give you Pitocin and pretty much break your water like right after. So I was terrified because I heard Pitocin is supposed to be really, really scary because it's supposed to intensify your cramps and kind of make labor go on very quickly. I was already terrified and then for you to do two things at the same time, I was just very terrified because I was like, oh, this is going to freaking hurt. Um, so at 8.30, they gave me Pitocin, they gave me the lowest dose of Pitocin and I didn't really feel anything. I managed to eat breakfast. Um, at the same time and it was cool I was chilling and then at 1030 still not feeling many cramps at all or contractions and then they went ahead and broke my water with the little hook that didn't really hurt or wasn't uncomfortable at all it just felt like someone poured warm water like in between your legs <laughs> like if they took a picture of water and just poured it in between your legs but other than that it wasn't painful at all um, but after they broke my water and gave me Pitocin, at 11 o'clock, so half an hour after they broke my water, I started getting extremely, extremely strong contra uh, contractions. My blood pressure was still extremely high at 153 over 92, and they retested my liver again, and the numbers were 279. So it wasn't going any higher, but it was kind of hanging around the same amount. Um, so I was breathing through contractions. They were rolling contractions. My contractions came like every three, two or three minutes and I was getting double back-to-back -back contractions. So it was like, as soon as I got one contraction, they lasted for about 50 seconds each, as soon as I got one contraction, another one came. But I got a three minute pause in between, and then it was two more again. So that's what was happening, and that started happening at 11 a.m. Um, at 12.20, I was breathing through all this for an hour and 20 minutes, at 12.20, I was like, look, I need to get checked. Um, I am in so much pain, I needed to get checked. My birth plan was I was going to endure the pain for as long as I possibly can and then see how far along I was. If I was only at like a four and I had a long way to go, I was going to get the epidural because I couldn't push through that. However, if I was already at like seven or an eight and I just didn't barely had any more left to go, I wasn't going to do it. I was going to do it naturally. So 1220, they broke my water at 1030. So it hasn't even been two hours. I'm GBS positive, risk of infection is great when they break your water. They were not willing to check me. They were like, we do not check you for at least two to four hours. We just broke your water not too long ago. You were only at four centimeters dilated. You're being induced. So they're like, there's no way. Like, we're not gonna check you. You're not like ready to push. There's no way. I was like, well then I, I need the epidural. I was like, I need the epidural and I need it now. So they were like, okay, okay, we're going to go get the anesthesiologists and we're going to give you the epidural. I was like, look, the anesthesiologist is going to take a couple of minutes. Can you please give me something now? So they gave me fentanyl, which is something they shoot into your IV line and um, it's supposed to help you with your pain. Uh, I think the dose of fentanyl that they gave me was too high. I don't know if it's because like I'm just a little person that never ever really takes any kind of drugs at all, ever. So as soon as I shot that up for me, that dose was really, really high because instantly I was so dizzy. They had me sit up to do my epidural and I could not even sit up. I sat up and I almost fell forward off the bed. The nurse had to catch me and I couldn't speak. Like I was zoned out. They were like, I, my eyes are like half closed and then they were just asking me questions like, are you okay? Do you know where you are? What day is it? You need to say something. Can you answer a question? Just say something, anything. 
I could hear them. I could not get myself to physically speak and answer them. I was just like falling over and like literally high out of my mind. Um, but still felt the pain for some reason. Like the contractions were still strong. Anyways, after a couple minutes of that, I think the fentanyl kind of like wore off a little bit. And um, I came back to like my regular self and I was like fully aware of what was going on and I could speak again. So anesthesiologists came and because UCSF is a teaching hospital, the anesthesiologist was trying to teach someone how to administer an epidural. And in that moment, I was in so much pain, I told them I could not sit still and bend over. They needed me to sit up and you needed to bend over and you needed to be super, super still for the epidural. My contractions were coming so fast and so hard, I could not sit still. And I told them, I was like, I can't sit still for you to give me this epidural. And they're like, well, you have to. So I was sitting there like, like freaking clenching my fist, trying my absolute best to sit still. They cleaned my back, sterilized it, and then they gave me a shot of lidocaine in my back. So they gave you a shot of lidocaine first in your back just to numb the area, and then they administer the epidural. So they gave me the shot of lidocaine ready. They had it taped off, sectioned off. They had it sterilized. But the freaking anesthesiologist was trying to teach the other guy how to do it, so they were taking forever, so long, that my nurse yelled at them and was like, what is taking so long? Because she could tell, like, I could not handle this anymore. And then as I'm sitting there, they're still talking about how to do it. And I was like, just thinking like, are you gonna have a student do this? Because that's sketchy, okay? I'm in so much pain and that's really sketchy. Like, can you just hurry up and give me the goddamn epidural? Um, anyways, it took forever. It probably took like 10 minutes. I was sitting there for like 10 minutes and I was just getting these contractions and I was like, I need a push. And the nurse was like, no, 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 no. And I was like, I need to push. And they were like, no, 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 just hold it, just hold it, just hold it. And I was like, I can't, I'm going to push. I just thought to myself, like, it was like such a built up of pressure where I needed to push. Like, there, I could not physically hold it anymore and I needed to push. Like, pushing was that relief that I needed. So I pushed. As soon as I pushed, um, I felt something like drop and come out of me and I was like, Oh my god, something came out, something that came out. I pushed and something came out. And the nurse was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, to the anesthesiologist. She's like, we need to check you. Laid me down and they checked me. And from what Simon said he saw, he said it was like a pretty big clump of blood that came out. Um, that's what he saw. They checked me and they're like, holy crap, you're crowning. Like, his head is right there. So I was completely dilated to 10 centimeters and I was ready to push. And that literally only took me, what? two hours since they broke my water um and you know they, I, they couldn't do it anyway so this was at this was about 12 37 exactly i was like i need to push so it was 17 minutes after i had asked for the epidural i was like i need to push and then they were like okay cool and then the anesthesiologist left because they never gave it to me because they weren't fast enough but i'm glad they didn't do it because it wouldn't have kicked in anyway i would have already been delivered if that makes sense. So anyways, I didn't get it. Um, so I pushed and I pushed for 40 minutes and I delivered him at 1.14 p.m. on September 3rd. And it was, it just, the pushing felt so, so long. Um, they kept saying like, just one more, just one more, just one more. I swear they said that like freaking 20 times and it just felt like forever. I just felt like every push that I was doing, they kept saying it was one more, and I just kept thinking, like, is it happening yet? Like, is it coming out yet? Am I making any progress yet, you know? They said I did really good, but I felt like it was forever, and it was, like, 40 minutes long. Um, but, yeah, he came out. I did tear, and I tore at the bottom, so on my perineum, which is the part, like, between your butthole and your vagina. That's where I tore, um, and they stitched me up. And funny thing, when they were stitching me up, oh yeah, by the way, my placenta came out like right after. Um, I delivered him, they put him on me. When they took him away after a minute, we did delay the cord clamping. Um, so we waited a minute before we cut the cord. And then after they took him away, they're like, cool, deliver placenta. I did one gentle push and it came right out. So there was no problems with that. And then um, they were stitching me up and I felt the stitches because they didn't give me enough lidocaine. And I was like, I was like, wait, wait, wait. I feel that and then they were like oh you do I was like yeah I feel that 
And then she was like, well, do you want me to give you more lidocaine or do you want to just kind of like push through these last couple of stitches? And I was like, I was like, just do it. Because my vagina area was so like burning and like honestly numbed out from pain of just like that burning sensation that and like the ripping that the stitches just felt like someone was taking a needle and just like barely scratching your skin with like a cold needle is what getting stitched up felt like without lidocaine, without enough lidocaine. Um, so they stitched me up and I was good to go. But I did notice something funny. My belly was still extremely large. And they pushed on it, you know, to try to get the uterus to shrink and go back down to where it's supposed to be. But my uterus was extremely large. And they did, told me, they were like, you're going to experience some light bleeding. Light bleeding, right? And I was like, okay, well, what's considered light and what's considered heavy? Because I felt like my bleeding was extremely heavy. They were coming out in gushes. Once again, I felt like someone was pouring jugs in between my legs of blood. And they were like, checking me. I was like, Every time I bled, it came out as a gush. It wasn't like like constant. It was just like shh, like every time. And every time I gushed, I was like to my nurse, I was like, can you please check me? I just felt a lot of blood. And every time she checked me, she was like, oh yeah, it's a little more than usual, but still like not bad. I was like, okay. So a couple of hours later, they had me get up and pee because that's what you need to do. You're supposed to get up and you're supposed to pee and pass gas and like all that kind of stuff. And when I got up to use the restroom, I felt fine. I walked to the bathroom by myself. The nurse was in there with me. I tried to pee. I couldn't pee. And then all of a sudden, I felt super lightheaded and I pretty much hemorrhaged in the restroom. Um, so I delivered at 1.14. This was around 6 p.m. So five hours later, I had delayed uterine hemorrhaging and I was passing blood clots like the size of a plate. Um, in the bathroom. The bathroom looked like a complete murder scene. There was blood on the toilet, on the floor, on the walls, on my nurse, on me, everywhere. There was just blood everywhere. Um, it was such an emergency. I was bleeding out so fast that she had to pull one of the red cords in the bathroom. The red siren went on. So many doctors rushed in and then they got me back onto the bed and I was just bleeding and bleeding. And they were changing the pads out from underneath me and weighing it because that's how they measure how much blood I was losing and I was just losing a lot of blood really quick. So the chief of the department actually came in and he did an ultrasound and I had so much blood in my uterus and they were huge huge clots. So my uterus would not stop bleeding and my body was trying to stop it be to, from bleeding out by clotting it. So I was passing these gigantic clots and he was talking to me he was like look we need to do something about this. You have two options. We could do a spinal tap. You'll be awake for the procedure. We're going to go in and do a DNC, which is a vacuum suction, suction out the blood clots, or you can be awake for this, and we're just going to massage your uterus and get it all out right here. And um, as he was giving me the options, I was bleeding out. Um, and then at a certain point, I couldn't do it anymore. I My body was so exhausted. I had just gotten through labor. I've been in the hospital for two full days now and like I was so weak and I knew that I couldn't be awake for an operation so I asked him I was like could you please just give me general anesthesia and just knock me out and go do this. He refused in the beginning because he was like that's really serious like that's really a dramatic step for something like this for a regular DNC but as we were speaking I was bleeding out so much that he was like, okay, you know what? We're going to knock you out. We're going to get you in right now. I had just eight, by the way. So they also needed to intubate me. So immediately they had papers. I was signing. I was like, I don't care. Just get me into the goddamn thing. I had to sign blood transfusion papers. I had to sign all these procedure papers, like consent forms. I was signing as they were wheeling me off. And it was just like so scary because the thought of like, what if like I don't come back from waking up you know and like seeing the sign and my mom and stuff like just crying and bawling their eyes out while I'm literally bleeding out and then they were wheeling me away um they wheeled me into the OR and you know it was cold had a million doctors and my nurse with me and um they were going over my case and it just felt something out of a Grey's Anatomy episode they were reviewing the plan the case going over all the information. Um, they had ordered blood for me that was coming from the blood bank, but it wasn't going to get here in time for my procedure, so they were going to use um, Oneg blood for me because um, I'm B, and um, they were going to use Oneg blood for me, and um, they intubated me. They first gave me um, some sort of like 
painkiller, like probably morphine, where I didn't have it, I didn't have any feeling in my whole body. And it was such a sense of relief because I was one, in a lot of pain, and two, my body was so weak that for all my muscles to relax felt so good. But when they intubated me, it felt like someone was choking me out. Like it felt like someone was wrapped their hands around me and they were pushing down on my throat. Intubated me, I was awake for that, and then they gave me the anesthesia and they knocked me out. When I woke up, um, I think the procedure was about 40 minutes. When I woke up, they um, were calling my names. So my legs were spread wide open and I was having massive uncontrollable diarrhea because apparently the medication they give you to stop, um, to stop your blood from bleeding and for you to clot causes major diarrhea. So I was literally having diarrhea with my legs wide open and I just feel someone like wiping my asshole and it was the most disgusting feeling in the world but like it's literally uncontrollable and my stomach hurt so bad and I could not control it. It was like explosive. That's disgusting. Anyways, they told me they got all the blood clots out. Um, I lost one and a half liters of blood and um, they told me that they did not need to give me any new stitches, that they didn't rip any of my stitches at all and they were all intact and everything was good. Um, and then they had to give me like anti-diarrhea medication to stop my diarrhea. I was on a bed having massive diarrhea in a bedpan. If you've ever had diarrhea laying down, trust me, this is like an ultimate low. It felt terrible. It was disgusting. Like I felt so bad for my nurses having to like change me and wipe me and clean me. I went through three bedpans of diarrhea is how bad it was. I was in the um, post-op room by myself for about two hours Simon came to visit me um, but by the time I got back to like my actual room my um, what is it postpartum room yeah a after I got to like my little postpartum room I was it was like probably I think 10 p.m. or so so I was in the operating room for quite some time and I was in post-op for a really long time just because like I wasn't waking up fully and I had all this diarrhea and then like I was nauseous and just it was all sorts of stuff but um yeah I was in the hospital for actually six full days after um with everything and I didn't get to really go home until the following Sunday so um actually no the following Saturday night so I was in there for six full days in the hospital I'm not gonna go into postpartum just because I think I'm gonna save that for another video because that was just up to my labor and delivery experience um, it was really rough, it was very scary, and I experienced so many complications. By the way, by this time, I had lost full function in the right side of my face. So I had Bell's palsy and um, was suffering from preeclampsia, I was anemic because I lost so much blood, I had hemorrhaged, and um, I just gave birth. So it was just a lot and it was really intense, but at the end of the day, it was all worth it. And as much as I'm suffering through PTSD, postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety from all that, I would do it again. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, leave it in the comment box below. Don't let my experience scare you just because it's not really typical uh, for all this kind of stuff to happen. It is a very, very, very small percentage of the population that experiences this, especially me having multiple complications stacked on top of each other. So don't let me scare you because it is seriously, for me personally, the labor and delivery part was actually not that bad. In the grand scheme of my entire stay there in the hospital, that was probably one of the easier parts um, of this whole process. So this is my little guy right here. So even though he was measuring so small, he turned out to be the biggest little bug. Look at how big he is. Hi, baby. <laughs> He's in the phase of just constantly eating his hand and putting everything into his mouth. So he turns six months today. Look, he's this little baby. Uh, yeah, say hi. Can you say hi? Oh, okay. So yeah, he's just huge and he's literally the sweetest thing. Um, he's such an easy baby to take care of and he's just great. And he's like half my size. Huh. How'd you get so big? How'd you get so big, baby? Alrighty. 
Say bye, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Say bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Uh, uh. Ula, ula. Ula, ula. <laughs>